shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of John. John chapter 6, provision and rejection. John chapter 6, provision and rejection. We're going to see that Jesus always provides for all of our needs and yet, sadly, is rejected by many. We're going to see how he provides two miracles. He's going to feed 5,000 plus women and children. He's going to provide faith for his disciples, even as he feeds us today. Uh, we'll see he provides teaching about food, the spiritual food, and the fact that he's the bread of life. He'll talk about life itself. He's God's bread of life, and he's the source of our eternal life. And then we're going to see that he's rejected, sadly, because of his teachings. And uh, yet the twelve, God bless them, they're going to remain with him. So we bring Jesus' provision to others. We share him with others, though they may reject us, but ultimately they're rejecting him, aren't they? And then let's remember that while we, re we accept him, are there areas in which we reject him? Whenever we're sinning, whenever we're stubborn, whenever we're not going to yield to him, we're going to go our way. Is that not, in a sense, rejecting him, at least in those areas? Let's pray that that is not the case. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this chance to look at your word. Help us to look at it maybe anew and afresh. We've seen these so many times before, these wonderful stories. But Lord, let something come out alive to us, a rhema that's going to speak to our spirits and give us food this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John 6, let's talk about the feeding of the 5,000. Chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. So we see that they followed him. He was popular, because uh, they were, many were sick, and um, he performed healing. He is the healer. He is the one who touches and heals our diseases. So Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Remember now that the Lord commanded them to go to Jerusalem to the temple to worship him on the three great feast days. The first in the year was, of course, the Passover. Fifty days later, it would be Pentecost. And then in the fall, it would be Tabernacles. So this is the first great feast. And so they're on the move, heading down towards Jerusalem. So it's a feast, it's near, and verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, one of the disciples, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Interesting question. Why is he asking that question? Well, just the way he works in my life as well as yours. He's always about building faith. If you went to a bodybuilder up at the corner at uh, Planet Fitness, the bodybuilder is going to look at you basically with the intent of building you up physically. So he or she is going to be designing exercises and diet and what have you to build you physically. Jesus becomes our bodybuilder, so to speak, spiritually. He can also be your bodybuilder physically too. But he's there to always build your faith, just like muscles, building your faith. So he throws a question at them which is going to require faith to be exercised. Verse 6, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Isn't it great that the Lord always knows what he's going to do? I've got questions today. I've got situations that require leadership and direction tomorrow. I don't know what to do, but he does. He always knows what he's going to do. Why don't we just trust in him and let him fulfill his plan? Well, Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii, now a denarius was a day's wage. We're talking about 200 days wages. Do the math on that. 200 a day's wages worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. 
we're going to see there were 5,000 men plus women and children. What does the average worker make today? $30,000 a year? $40,000 a year maybe? Take two-thirds of that. So let's say that he's saying here $20,000 or $30,000 is not going to feed this crowd. That was a pretty big crowd. And so we, we can't do it. There's no way. We're out here in the wilderness. Well, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? So Andrew's thinking, he's looking around, and he does see that, but it's not much. So he does at least identify there's something to work with. Not much. And he adds that part, but at least he's looking. Philip's not even looking. He just says we can't do it. But there's an Andrew here who says, well, there is this, but how is this going to meet the need? So let's at least be like Andrew. Not Philip saying we can't do it. But Andrew says, it's not much, but we could at least start with this. Well, then Jesus said, and here's an important principle, the Lord is going to work with whatever you will willingly offer him. May not be much, may not be sufficient, but whatever you offer him, he will take it. Remember now, he can give us the ability. We have to bring the availability, right? We bring, the ability, we bring the availability, I'm available, Lord. He'll give us you the ability you need. So Jesus then said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Not even as much as they needed, but as much as they wanted. And so here we have distribution going on immediately. Now, what do we have? Five loaves and two fish? The barley loaves, by the way, were the barley was the poorest crop. It wasn't as good as wheat and the, the other uh, grains. It was, it was a poor person's uh, deal, but it was something. And uh, uh, actually, if you study nutrition and, and line up nutrition with the Bible, you're going to find that God has been very gracious. You know one of the greatest uh, meals possible is a very poor person's meal? And uh, it's among the poorest folks in the world, at least in the Hispanic world, and that's beans and rice. Very good diet. And uh, so God has not disadvantaged people. The trouble we get into dietary-wise going off in a different direction is we get in trouble with disease when we start getting into the fancy foods that are not available to the poor folks. We start eating too much of the very fancy things. Uh, I made a study back in 1990, 91. I was really studying food from the biblical perspective. When you look at the Bible, uh, pay attention to food. You're going to see about it. You can see in David's time, in these times, uh, those quality foods that are still available today. Uh, we get in trouble when we get into the things that are not what we call living foods. Living foods are as natural as you can get. The not living foods are ice cream, cake, french fries, those fun things. In any event, um, five loaves and two fish. That's not much, is it? But at least they're starting. And so they take that and they begin to distribute it. Verse 12, so they were filled. Well, they had enough. They had enough and all they wanted. And so it is when the Lord provides for you and for me. He's passing it out, and it begins to multiply again and again and again. All right, we're in John chapter 6, and beginning now with verse 12. So they were filled. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. I like that. If you ever try to run a household budget, you're going to realize that it's important to save food called leftovers. We have the privilege of having in our family somebody who, to my knowledge, never eats leftovers, refuses to do it. And uh, that's, uh, <laughs> it's, I pray for that young fellow, he's going to be able to have a nice job someday that can provide for fresh meals every single day. But you know, not only are leftovers necessary, some foods are better the next day. You get some of your stews and, and casseroles and things, they're better, they're tastier the next day, and they're still good for days on, on end. Save, not just food, be, be thrifty. Extra pieces of cloth, for whatever uh, it is. Save it, you might need it someday. So they gathered them up, and now they had 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. So they had more left over than when they had started. 
Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So here we find that he's providing a miracle. Another gospel writer says he was feeding 5,000 men plus women plus children. So a total would be how many? Who knows? 10, 15,000 people? And uh, this is a miracle. It's an instantaneous production of food. Taking nothing from this miracle. When you and I give thanks for our food and our daily meals, we're really acknowledging God's miracle working power. Because whatever food you're eating is also a miracle. It took time, maybe uh, it was on the hoof, maybe it was in the ground, off the tree, but it took maybe some months or some years, but it's still a miracle, it's still food. And this is simply a hurrying up process immediately, instantaneously, of what God does every day in feeding over 7.6 billion people. And as we give thanks and gratitude, let's not forget those who do not have enough for today. And Lord, may I pray for them, and if the opportunity comes, even help them. So a wonderful miracle. I think it's all summarized by Paul so clearly regarding Jesus providing. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the food that you provide for us every single day. Well, let's look now at another uh, miracle. The Lord is working with faith. He's building their faith. Uh, you need to exercise, right? You've got to keep exercising. And uh, I was over at the uh, a nursing home the other day, and I'll probably pay another visit today or tomorrow, um, visiting a member of the family who's in a nursing home. And one of the things that's really important in a nursing home, as well as in every area of our lives, is exercise. First question we always ask is, did so-and-so walk this person today? It's one of the very first questions I ask, even though it's not my job as a pastor. I walk in, if I'm visiting that person who's a parishioner or somebody I know, hi, how you doing? How's the food? It's always lousy. Did you eat enough? Oh yeah. Uh, what about a walk? And more than once I've said, uh, with permission from the nursing staff, may I walk you? So part of the job that I assume is to walk that person down the hall and then we can talk on the way because exercise is very important. What about spiritual exercise? He has exercised their faith in the area of the feeding of the 5,000. But he wants to go further. Did you ever go through an exercise program and the coach, the trainer, the, the drill sergeant said more, more? He said enough. They say no, more, more, more. They're saying that's enough. I've seen 5,000 plus fed. The Lord's got more. It's just building muscles. He wants to keep building your faith more and more. We progress, Paul says, from faith to faith. All right? There's going to be another one now because they're going to have to deal with faith in a different area. Food was the first area. Fear is the second area. Let's look at verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. They were so excited about his providing the food, they wanted to make him king. But it wasn't time. It's still not time. He'll be king one day, but it's still not time for him to be king over Israel. He knows the timing. Not now. And it's important if you want to work with God to know God's timing. Jesus did. It was not his time. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Let's figure, what do you think, about six o'clock at night maybe, just guessing? It's about six o'clock at night. That's important. Watch this. They got into the boat and they went over the sea toward Capernaum. So they're at the Sea of Galilee. They're in the northern part on the eastern shore. They're starting to head back home across the Sea of Galilee. It's about five miles at that point where they're crossing, six at most. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. So here are the disciples. They're in the boat. They're starting to head back home. <clears throat> He's up on the mountain. He's praying. He's also able to see them. And the sea arose because of a great wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. So here they're rowing, and they've gone maybe halfway, two-thirds of the way. They've been struggling. Another gospel writer tells us in the fourth watch, they left around 6 o'clock the previous night. It's now about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning the following day. So they've been going uh, about 12 hours almost, and they still haven't gone across. Reminds us of you and me when the storms of life come. And we get in the boat and we take the oars. 
I'll take care of this, Lord. And we begin to row. We begin to row, and we begin to row. And we just, the wind is great, and we just can't seem to get any place. When I was over in Israel my first time over there, I saw such a wind as this. It was so bad, within minutes, the waves began to build so high, we could not cross over the Sea of Galilee by boat. We had to take a bus around uh, the southern side. It was that bad. Within 15 minutes, it became a totally different scene. Well, here they are. They're rowing and they're struggling, and Jesus is walking on the water. And another gospel writer tells us he's walking by as if he was just going to go someplace else. Well, they were afraid. Well, you and I would be as well. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. It is I. Do not be afraid. Write that on a piece of paper and put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror, in your bathroom, whatever. It is I. Do not be afraid. That will get you through many storms of life. They willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So John adds that little detail. We know from the other gospel writers that uh, Peter wanted to walk on the water, and he was fine. Remember that? He was walking on the water. He did great as he looked at Jesus, and then he looked at the waves, and he said, oy vey, right? <laughs> and down he began to go. Great lesson for us as well. You keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to be fine. You look at the waves, and down you go. And so they were afraid, but the Lord was showing them that he was able to be there for them, and he just said, peace, be still to that storm. And he'll say, peace, be still to the storm in your life. Well, they, they got them into the boat. They were grateful. Uh, it took them almost 12 hours to go a little more than halfway across the Sea of Galilee. He got in the boat, and they were there immediately. The Lord told me this analogy about oars some years ago. And he said to me, Jerry, when I'm sitting in a boat with you, there's one set of oars. And there's you, and there's me. And I want to see what you want to do. And many times, Jerry, you grab those oars. You're just a pig about that. You just grab those oars, and you begin to row, and you row, and you row, and you're getting nowhere. Why don't you let me take the oars? I'll get you to the other side. Not in 12 hours. I'll get you there immediately. So if you're struggling on the storm of life and the sea of life, um, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Get me to the other side. And so he will do that. So here we find building a faith. Faith for food, faith to conquer fear. And now we're going to see that he's going to use these object lessons to talk about a more important aspect, and that is bread from heaven. Verse 22. He's talking here about spiritual food. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except that one which the disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people uh, therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into boats, they came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So, they thought he was gone. They got in their boats and they went back over to the western side where he was. And they found him on the other side of the sea. And they said to him, Rabbi or teacher, when did you come here? So Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So the Lord is always taking our daily questions and practices and turns them into spiritual lessons of far greater consequence. Again, verse 26, you're looking for the signs, you're looking for the miracles, and we all do that. That's, those are wonderful. You know, those signs are, first of all, advertisements for the Lord. They confirm his word. They are hooks to catch us in. How many folks have gone to uh, healing ministries and gotten hooked in the gospel because of that? We were talking to uh, someone after service last week who was visiting um, an old friend of ours, and Kelly and I were talking, and one of Kelly's great heroines of the faith is Catherine Coleman, the great, wonderful uh, faith healer. And he had gone to see Catherine Coleman and and uh, she'd ministered to him, and he went and followed her for several other visits around there. And that hooked him in. 
and why not to see the wonderful miracles that were taking place and so uh, uh, these healing signs are advertisements for the Lord they're uh, confirming his word they hook you in but also he wants you healed he wants you well like any parent would want but let's not get our eyes on the signs let's get our eyes on the sign giver that's the important thing not the gifts so much as the gift giver love the gifts but let's get our eyes on the gift giver uh, that's just human nature and that's divine nature right so if I married the lovely Kelly Marie Lynn and she was all about the gifts, what could I, want? I want a ring and I want a car and I want a house and I want a this or that, I might say somewhere along the line, uh, what about me? And she'd say, you old geezer, that's fine. That she, but you want to seek the giver, not just the gift. The gifts will flow. But uh, Lord, I want to seek you. He wants their eyes not on the gifts, but on the giver. Let's look at that from that perspective here. So you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Um, so what you really wanted to do was get it, not even for the signs, you wanted it just on the basic level, you wanted your tummies filled. And how many folks come to the Lord just for that? Let's be honest. Some people come to the Lord just when they need things. Not just to say, I don't need anything, but I love you today. Just want to hang out with you. I just love you, Lord. Don't labor for the food which perishes. How many of us do that? It's all about the jobs. One job, two jobs, three jobs. Labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Labor for the God's word and for God's son, the bread of life. And this, the son of man is going to give this to you, he says, because God the Father has set his seal on him. God the Father has approved Jesus as the life giver. Everlasting life comes through him. So we need to check ourselves out and make sure that our motives are correct. We are to work. The apostle is very clear. Paul says that we are to work. If you don't work, you don't eat. It's just that simple. If you can work, you do work. Uh, and sometimes you have to work long hours. And sometimes you have to work extra hours. Uh, and maybe there's time and a half and you're going to want to take advantage of that. And that's all natural and that's all good as long as it's of God and we get our perspective on him and don't make the money the main object. Jesus said that's a main struggle we're going to have. Mammon, the God of wealth versus God. And there's going to be a tension in our lives. Who are you going to serve? And that's why God gave a solution on how to win that battle. And that's why he said, let's win the battle right in the beginning. When you get the dollar, 10% belongs to me. That's the tithe. It's holy. It's set apart. You give that 10% to me, he says, return it to me. And I'll give you directions also on giving offerings to me over and above that and even alms to the poor. Then you already have been able to part with the first dollars, so it's no longer a God to you. Now I'm going to show you how to manage the remaining 90% or whatever's left over, and I'll meet all of your needs through that. Well, he goes on to say here, let's look for the food that's never going to perish. So verse 28, they said to Jesus, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Underline that. That's such an important verse. Verse 28 is such an important verse for deciding how do we get to heaven? How do we do the works of God? How do we please God? 7.6 billion people in this world, as we said. Only 2 billion claim to have Jesus in any way as the Savior and provider. The others don't. 1.1 billion are Roman Catholic and almost 1 billion, 900,000 are Protestants, they claim Jesus uh, as Lord and Savior, not that he actually is in many cases, but that's their claim. What about the other five plus billion? What shall we do to work the works of God? They ring doorbells on Saturday, they pray five times a day, they uh, give money, they pray, they do this, they do that, they read the Koran, they read the Bible, whatever they're doing. What can you do to work the works of God? How do you get to heaven? How do you please God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. What's the work of God? Believe. What's the word believe mean? Pistuo? It means to lean on him totally, completely, trusting in him alone. Not trusting in Jesus plus last rites. Trusting in Jesus plus lighting candles. Trusting in Jesus plus tithing. 
Trusting in Jesus plus church attendance. Trusting in Jesus plus what? No. Trusting in Jesus, period. Alone. All we can do to please God, all we have to do to please God, is to trust in Jesus. When he said it's finished on the cross, he meant that. It's finished. Everything that's necessary for your salvation has been completed. Just believe and trust in me. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? So they still weren't satisfied. And they were really testing him in a sense. Some folks are never satisfied. You notice that? Not just with Jesus, but you try to please them. Uh, Again, getting back to kids with food, some kids will say, anything that you give me, I'm so grateful for. Others, no, I don't really like that. And uh, you have to learn how to, to deal with those situations. Let's be the kind of people who say, thank you, Lord, for whatever you give me. Well, what sign will you perform then? And uh, now they're, they're, they're testing him. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're still on the physical plane, that food, talking about the manna uh, coming down from heaven every day. But Jesus is trying to elevate their understanding in verse 32. Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. There it is. How do I keep myself satisfied spiritually? How is my hunger satisfied spiritually? Through Jesus Christ. He's the bread of heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So all that you need spiritually is going to be from him. And all that you need, what flows from spiritual reality, physical, emotional, even the natural food you're going to eat, it all flows from him. But it all flows from him and through him. Well, they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. So now they're still not quite sure what he's talking about. Uh, they, They want this bread, but they're still not identifying it with him. So Jesus said to them, verse 35, He makes it very clear, (coughs) excuse me, I am the bread of life. Think about that. I am the bread of life. I'm the one who satisfies your every complete need. Now he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Isn't that wonderful? (coughs) Excuse me. You're going to find that whatever you need in any area of life, he'll provide for you. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you don't believe. You don't believe that I'm the bread of life. Ask yourself that. (coughs) I've seen him. Do I believe? When you have fear, doubt, you're not believing. He said, fear not. We saw that earlier. Verse 20, it is I. Do not be afraid. When I'm afraid, I'm not believing. Lord, help me to believe always. But I said to you that you have seen me, you don't believe, and all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. There is your salvation right there, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. There is your doctrine of being chosen, doctrine of election. Some get kind of confused about that. Does that mean that some are elected and some are not? Yes, that's that's what it means. But that doesn't seem fair. Well, first of all, God is fair. Second of all, who are we to judge God and what he does? (coughs) And thirdly, if we're concerned about the one who has not been chosen, or that person thinks he's not been chosen, the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll find that you were chosen all along. So God is the one who chooses. Were you chosen? Are you born again? You thank God for being chosen. If you've been praying for somebody in your family who has not been chosen, continue to pray. Lord, choose them and encourage them to call on the name of the Lord. Verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Oh, that's so important. What am I here for? I did it my way, the old song is. No, it's God's way. We're here to do his will. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Oh, there's your eternal security. 
When God the Father gives you to the God the Son, he'll hold on to you. No one's going to take him out of, take you out of his hand. John 15 talks about that as well. Whoever God has chosen is saved. And that person may backslide, may make mistakes, may sin, but God is going to make sure that person is turned around by the power of the Holy Spirit and make it all the way home. He'll raise you up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For those of you who are watching by television and YouTube, perhaps other countries, if you're not certain of your salvation, not certain that you're chosen, simply do this. As Paul says to the Roman church, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, be saved. Call on Jesus and say, Lord, save me, choose me, elect me to salvation, and hold on to me for eternity. And you'll find that he will do that. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the program. Well, that was the first part, provision. That's the delightful part. Now the tough part, rejection. Beginning in verse 41, he's going to talk about um, how they're going to begin to turn from him. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So they're beginning to grumble among themselves. See, they can't really grasp it. They're not ready for it. Um, they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Hey, this is the carpenter's son. In fact, he's a carpenter himself. He's a hometown boy. How can God send a Messiah, Messiah, a Savior, who is just somebody we know? Well, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Don't murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And again, he says, I'll raise him up at the last day. So you can't come unless the Father draws you. If you know the Lord, you think back on how you came to Christ, you think at first, I chose the Lord. No, actually, he chose you. It's almost as though you were propelled, not that you were uh, involuntary in the process, but he just moved you along to salvation. And you realize it was all of God. And he'll raise you up, for sure. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. So there he's quoting from the Old Testament Isaiah. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So there's that work of the Holy Spirit as he teaches us about God. And uh, we want to be in Sunday school, we want to be in church, we want to be watching programs on YouTube and what have you. Uh, and for those who have those resources available, use them. But for those that don't have those resources, God will still teach. He'll somehow still provide for them. We want to make sure that people have Bibles all over the world, get them into their hands. But um, God is able to provide for them. Not that anyone has seen the Father, verse 46, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. That's Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. So John is being repetitious here, and the Holy Spirit is being repetitious. When there's repetition, don't be like an English teacher and take your red pen and say repetitious and deduct five points. Say, what's the lesson here? Why is it being said over and over and over again? Because we need it. We need it. I am the bread of life. Next time you're lacking anything, go to Jesus. Lord, I need you. I'm the bread of life. And uh, that applies on spiritual matters. But again, it applies physically, <clears throat> emotionally, spiritually. You know, I also use it for nutrition, for physical food. Even though he's talking about spiritual food here. Ask him the diet that's right for you what you should be eating. And uh, he may take you down an interesting journey now and then. Anyway, he says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, talking about the physical food. They're now dead. And this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. So when you eat of me, you're never, ever going to die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Talk about living. He continues to live. Even as we look at food in the Bible and realize that the more living the food is, the more natural it is, the better it is for us, how much more Jesus is the living spiritual bread. He's constantly alive. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. 
and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. That's how we get that eternal life. He gives of his flesh. He dies in our place for our sins. Well, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. And these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, we just had communion this morning, and as we did, we remembered the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We ate the bread and thought about our bodies being healed and drank the uh, cup and thought about uh, the spiritual healing with sins being removed. Uh, and so we did it in remembrance. This morning, there were others in other churches who had elements like that, but they thought in their, their way of teaching that uh, they were actually participating in the eating of the, the literal body of Jesus and his blood. We don't subscribe to that. We're not here to argue that. It's called transubstantiation, and another denomination calls it consubstantiation. But it really goes against the scriptures when Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. That's what it's all about. It's remembrance. Remember, he said it's finished, so there's nothing I can do to add to it. I can't take the bread and add to his sacrifice. I can't drink the cup and make it any more complete. He's done everything that's necessary. But we need to also take an attitude. My late brother, Dr. Casey Lynn, had a very interesting thought. Uh, toward the end of his life, when he was, um, he battled uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for 10 long years at a time when there was no cure. And I'm not even sure there is today to the non-Hodgkin's variety. But he had 10 wonderful years, painful years, but powerful years in ministry. And uh, toward the end of his life, he had communion every day. Every day he would have his own uh, little private communion service. And he said to me, Jerry, uh, we were pretty much raised as Protestants, and we were taught that it's in remembrance of the Lord. And, and yet, and the Roman Catholics and uh, even the Lutherans think that it's uh, somehow participating in the literal body and blood of Christ. And he said, obviously, I think the truth is somewhere in between. And that's usually a good, safe place to be. No, it's not the literal body and the blood of Christ. And be careful with this idea of remembrance that it's not too casual. Yep, thanks, Lord. Appreciate it. But really enter into it. So that when we are taking the bread, think about it. As I take that bread and put it between my teeth and I hear that crunch, I'm thinking about the crunching of his body, the giving of his body, the whips on, uh, on his back, and the stripes on his back, and the physical healing that's mine. And I'm going to appropriate that healing right now as I eat this bread in remembrance. And then as I take that cup, and I drink that juice, or drink that wine, that I'm remembering that my sins have been forgiven and washed away by the blood of Christ. So kind of a halfway position there. Not just a casual remembrance, nor an understanding that it's literally the body and the blood, but... It's a remembrance, but really get into remembering and appropriate for yourself the fullness of healing, both physically and spiritually. And so we need to partake of him. Lord, how do I eat your body? How do I drink your blood? Am I eating the body of Jesus enough each day? Am I drinking the, body, the blood of Jesus every day? How do you do that? By relating to him. Appropriate me is what he's saying. Appropriate me in every decision of your life, in every action of your life, every reaction of your life, in prayer, in the study of the word, in fellowship with people, in your giving, in your trusting. Just make it all about me. That's what it is. Just make it all about me. Lord, help me to do that more. And so he goes on to say, uh, it, uh, he says here in verse um, 
26, as the Father has life in himself, he's granted the Son to have life in himself. Real life is in Jesus. And again, he's going to be raising us up. Don't marvel at this, verse 28. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Is it, uh, let me see, where, where did I end up here? I got so, so sidetracked by that. Um, what was it? Yeah, the, I got through 58, didn't I? Down to 59, thanks. I got so sidetracked about that. Thank you. All right, now let's, so that's about, the, about eating him. Just appropriate him. And Lord, show me how to appropriate you more every single day. Now verse 60, let's uh, close with these last few verses here. Uh, he's rejected by many. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And it's a hard saying to many today. Eat Jesus, appropriate him, make him everything in your life. Call him before you call 911. Call him before you call the loan officer. Call him before you call uh, someone on Facebook or uh, Googling. Call him first. Put him first, last and always. Well, Jesus, verse 61, he knew in himself his disciples complained about this. And he said, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So this is offensive. I'm talking about having to appropriate me and lean on me only for your salvation. The Holy Spirit's going to reveal that to you and he'll give you life. The, the fleshly approach towards me won't profit anything. You can't just do it through rites and rituals and traditions. The words that I speak to you, they're words of spirit and they're words of life. But there are some of you who do not, do not believe. And Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. He said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my father. So from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? The crowd was really thinning out, wasn't it? From 5,000 plus to... Now it's down to just about almost the 12. And so it often is with you when you go through a hard time and you're looking for your friends. And it's not uh, wine and roses. And you start to see, whoa, there aren't too many here who are standing with me. And so do you want to go away also? Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love that. Sometimes you and I get discouraged. But where are you going to go? Who else has eternal life? You think maybe this is a hard old way. There were times when I wanted to give the ministry up when I first got started 40 years ago. My mother said, what else are you going to do? <laughs> I'd already sold my law practice, wasn't practicing law anymore. And uh, what are you going to do? All I knew was law and, and ministry. But more importantly, to whom would you go besides Jesus? He was the only one that would ever meet your needs. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not only do you have the words of eternal life, you are the one who is the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. So Jesus answered them, did I not choose you? Talking about that choosing doctrine. The twelve, but now one of you is a devil. See, he knows who that's going to be. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. He always knew it was going to be him. But he didn't treat him any differently. And no one else knew it was Judas. He was able to just blend in with the crowd, do the miracles and other stuff as well. So we've seen here provision and rejection. And we've seen that these apply to our lives today. Every day we've got challenges. You've got opportunities to build faith. When you see a problem, see it as an opportunity to grow in faith, not as a problem that's going to make you unhappy, that you're going to fail, that's going to make your life miserable. You need to grow. You need to grow from faith to faith, problem to problem, victory to victory. So provision is always going to be there, no matter what it is. There'll be rejection. Certain folks are going to reject you. Old friends are not going to be there for you the way they used to be. Members of the family aren't going to be able to walk with you the way you'd like if you're going to be walking into that straight and narrow path. But you're going to be always trusting in him that, Lord, I have you and that's all that I need. And you'll find that he'll meet your needs. And you'll find also that he's going to be, bring folks around you who will help you uh, in your Christian walk. So we're going to be gathering uh, now for prayer. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. 
And uh, let's ask for him to bring this about in our lives. Father, we're grateful for this chapter. It's a long one, a lot of uh, important things, but some very clear points have popped out to us. And that is that you're our provider. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Every single one of those needs. Lord, help us to trust you for physical food today, for spiritual food, for healing, for finances, for peace, for close bonding and fellowship with you and others of like precious faith. You're our provider, Lord. Also for rejection. Help us to understand, Lord, that there are those who are going to reject you. We can pray for them. We can't control them. But help us not to reject you, Lord. Not to reject you outright, outright as our Savior, but to accept you and then to accept all that you want to teach us. Not to just accept you as Savior, but say, no, you can't heal me. No, you can't meet my needs. No, I have to go out and do this addictive practice, that sinful behavior. I've got to do it my way. Help us to surrender. You came, Lord, to do the will of the Father. Help us to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Moment your needs to supply.